And now, Lord, our eyes are upon you. We ask that you will visit us again tonight and transform us by your word. We give you praise and glory for it. In Jesus' precious name we have prayed. Somebody believe, say loud, amen. amen. Give Jesus a big hand and please, you may be seated in his presence. It is my year of breaking limits. Before we go further tonight, if you're here tonight worshiping with us for the first time in this church, whether here at the U Chapel or in any one of our zones across Lagos, Otta, or the environs, if tonight is your first time with us in this church, please would you quickly rise on your feet. We want to pray with you and bless you. Tonight is your first time in this church. Give Jesus a big hand, everybody. As they rise everywhere, it's worth your praise. Our features will put in your hand a slip that you will need to fill. As soon as you receive your copy of that slip, take your seat for a moment and fill that slip in the course of this welcome. As soon as you receive your copy, please take your seat and begin filling that slip in the course of this welcome. I want to welcome you tonight on behalf of Jesus Christ, the head of the church, and on behalf of his servant, the apostle over this commission, Bishop David Oedipo. I want you to know you have come tonight to a mountain of God and to a city of refuge. And that means every siege against your life and against your destiny comes to an end tonight in the name of Jesus Christ. According to scriptures, we are made to understand that God has appointed places for his people. He said, I'll appoint a place for my people. They will not move anymore. Neither will the sons of wickedness afflict them as before time. I believe that God has brought you tonight for an encounter with your appointed place. And that means every blessing that is allotted to you will begin following after you from tonight in Jesus' name. But to enjoy the blessings of your appointed place, you cannot be a passerby. Rather, you must be planted. The Bible says those who are planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the court of our God. Therefore, my charge to you tonight is set you down here. Engage every word that comes from this altar in teachings, instructions, and prophetic directions. And as you put the word of God to work, his word will work wonders in every department of your life. And very shortly, not only will you have testimonies, but you shall become a testimonial in the name of Jesus Christ. One more time, all our first time worshippers, please rise on your feet for a word of prayer and blessing. Please rise on your feet for a word of prayer and blessing. Bow your head as we pray. Our Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you tonight for these precious ones. You have drawn them by your mighty hand and you brought them to bless them. Therefore, tonight, by your authority, we decree each one of them blessed. Whatever they left as a concern to come to your presence, let it be converted into an open testimony. And in the name of Jesus, any one of them that is yet to be saved, tonight is declared the day of their salvation. Thank you, Father, for it. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. Please be seated. Ensure your forms are completed and submitted to the official closest to you. Again, you're welcome and God bless you. Give Jesus a big hand, everybody. One more time, will you lift up your right hand before the Lord, everyone, and ask the Lord, speak to me tonight. Speak to me tonight. Lord, by your word, speak to me tonight. I'm here to encounter you. I'm here to be changed by you, to be transformed by you. Speak to me tonight. Speak to me tonight. He said, day unto day utter speech, but night unto night shows knowledge. Lord, the knowledge for the night show to me tonight. Open the eyes of my understanding and give me light. In the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' precious name. Somebody believe, say loud, Amen. Amen. We began looking at this line of teachings on Wednesday in our midweek service entitled Understanding How to Build your faith for a fight understanding how to build your faith for a fight and let me begin by reminding us that whether you are aware of it or not we are engaged in a perpetual battle we're in a continuous battle in Re revelation chapter 12 verse 17 the bible makes us to understand there he said, and the dragon was wrought with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandment of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. These are people who were busy serving God, godly individuals. But the Bible said that they were at war. There was a battle region. Please hear this and hear it very well. You are at war. It is something that you must recognize. I believe that one of the greatest risks in the time of war is to think that it's the time of peace. You must recognize that we are at war. 
In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 and 4, the Bible says that although we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of stronghold. In other words, God makes it clear that while we are walking, we are warring. What may look like just a general day is a warfare day. At every point in time, we have an adversary that is on the loose. In 1 Peter 5 verse 8, the Bible said, be sober, be vigilant. It said, because your adversary, the devil, goes around like a roaring lion, looking for whom he may devour. So we are in a battle and we have an identified enemy. The identified enemy is the devil himself. He said, your adversary, the devil, goes, along, goes around like a roaring lion, seeking for whom he may devour. Everything that we see around us is pointing to the fact that we are at war. Even our prophecies must be warred with before they will be delivered. In 1 Timothy 1.18, he said, According to the prophecies that have gone forth before thee, that thou mightest war a good warfare. So we are at battle at every point in time. God told the children of Israel, he said, I'm giving you Sion the Amorite and his land. He said, but begin to contend with him in battle. Deuteronomy chapter 2 verse 24. So there is a battle that must be engaged in before we can see the fulfillment of even the prophetic word. Everything around us is a pointer to the fact that we are at war. In 1 Corinthians 16 verse 9, we are told that a great door and effectual is open. He said, but there are many adversaries. So even when doors are open, the devil may not be able to shut the door, but he stands in your way to enter the door. There is a battle that is continuously raging. But the answer to the battle or the avenue for triumph in that battle is the avenue of faith. The Bible says in 1 John 5, 4, it said, Whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So our faith is our only guarantee for triumph. Without faith, you may end up a victim in this battle. But I pray that for each one of us as our faith comes alive in this season, none shall end up as a victim in the name of Jesus Christ. Somebody believe me, say louder, amen. amen. But we have come to recognize that your faith must be built. Your faith must be built. And we saw beginning from Wednesday and yesterday also that the avenue for building your faith is primarily the word of God. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. So we said faith has to do with both hearing and understanding God's word. That it is spiritual understanding that activates faith. Until our understanding comes alive, our faith cannot be quickened. It is our understanding, therefore, that gives validity to our faith. In the book of Acts chapter 20 verse 32, Paul speaking there said... I commend you to God and to the one of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among them that are sanctified. So to be built up, you need God's word. And it is the understanding of the word that builds you up for triumph. I see each one of us receiving grace for spiritual understanding in the name of Jesus Christ. And we have come to recognize that that spiritual understanding that builds our faith can be activated by the word of God. I mean, by the, by the altar of prayer. Paul praying in the book of Ephesians 1, 17, he said that the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened. And how would that happen in verse 17? He says that God will grant unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. So the spirit of revelation and wisdom, which we activate through prayer, is what opens the eyes of our understanding as we stand before the word of God. No wonder we are told in Jude, in Jude verse 20, it said, building up yourself upon your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. So the altar of prayer gives us an avenue for the building up of our faith. Because as we stand in prayer, the eyes of our understanding opens up. My prayer is that as we conclude this week of emphasis tonight, the eyes of your understanding will open up. Somebody believe it, say louder, Amen. I said, somebody believe it, say louder, amen. amen. The good news is that faith has unlimited capacity for growth. In 2 Thessalonians 1, 3, the Bible says that your faith groweth exceedingly. 
it has unlimited capacity for growth. There is no end to the growth of your faith if you have no end to the growth in the world. As we grow in the world, we continue to grow in faith. And when we grow in faith, we are growing our command. It's vital for us to understand that there is no end to it. Thank God for the faith that you have right now, but it can be built even further. It can be built even stronger. It can be built even higher. So you and I have a responsibility to continue to build our faith. But we have come to recognize that the faith that works has specific characteristics. What are some of these characteristics? We began looking at all of this Wednesday and we saw some of it yesterday. And we continue again in this service tonight. What are the characteristics of the faith that works? The kind of faith that will win the battles of life. What are the characteristics of this kind of faith? We look at four of these characteristics tonight. And I believe that the Holy Ghost will give us understanding. Number one is it must be kingdom advancement driven faith. The kind of faith that works is kingdom advancement driven faith. If you want your faith to deliver supernaturally, one of the avenues to activate the unlimited power that faith carries is by the advancement of the kingdom of God. In the book of Matthew chapter 6 verse 33, we are familiar with this scripture. It says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. The things that others are trying to engage their faith to pursue will be added unto you as you engage in the advancement of the kingdom of God. We just had two powerful testimonies tonight that go to validate this fact. Somebody said that he had bone marrow disease. He could not sit, could not stand for any period of time, could not walk. He was in this condition and has been in that situation for years. But he began to advance the kingdom of God on the altar of prayer in the pursuit of souls. And suddenly, he says, God showed up. And what he has been struggling with. Remember I said he had a surgery where even his testicle has been removed. But then what he has been struggling with, suddenly God showed up and visited him. The testicle that was removed was replaced by God. God has spare parts in heaven. There is nothing that is lost on the earth that God does not have, have replacement in heaven. And the good news is that God does not need to cut you open to put whatever is missing back in. That man woke up one day and testicle that was removed surgically has been replaced miraculously by the power of the almighty God. Is somebody getting what God is saying tonight? He was advancing the kingdom and his faith was quickened and what men will call impossible was supernaturally done. Bone marrow disease disappeared and then testicle missing reappeared by the mighty hand of God. This is what happens when we engage in the advancement of the kingdom of God. Our faith is activated to deliver the supernatural. I pray that for each one of us, as we continue advancing God's cause and God's kingdom, your faith and my faith will begin to deliver greater dimensions of the supernatural. Somebody believe it, say louder, amen. In Romans 8, 28, the Bible says to us, all things work together for the good of them that love God. And the expression of our love for God is our priority for the kingdom of God. He said that all things work together. You are not working them, they are working for you. When you begin advancing the kingdom of God, there is a rearrangement in the in this realm of the spirit. That the things others are working to get, begin working to get to you. They start working together to arrive in your life by reason of your advancement for the kingdom of God. That's what happens when we engage in advancing God's kingdom. Our faith begins to, you know, pro provoke the miraculous to occur on our behalf. I see that becoming somebody's experience here in the name of Jesus Christ. You believe it, say louder, amen. amen. Now, in the book of Ephesians chapter 3, the Bible paints it to us this way. Beginning from verse 16 all the way down to verse 20. It tells us this. It said that God will grant unto you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Now, look at verse 17. That Christ may dwell in your heart by faith, but that you may be rooted and grounded in love. Christ dwells in your heart by faith, but the root 
that will make him manifest his love. He said that you may be able to, he said that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, and the height, and the depth, and to know the love of God, verse 19, which passes all knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God, verse 20. Now, unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you can ask or think according to the power that is at work in you. What is that power that is at work in you? He said, Christ in you, the hope of glory. He dwells in you by faith, but the root that will make it manifest is love. So when you and I begin to exhibit the love of God, we begin to manifest the power of God. When you exhibit the love of God, you naturally begin to manifest the power of God. God's power will always manifest where God's love is exhibited. That's why you check it all through the scriptures and in contemporary history. You see those who advance the kingdom of God ceaselessly will always manifest the power of God continuously. The power of God will keep flowing where the love of God keeps showing. That is the key. If you keep showing God's law, you will keep flowing with God's power. I see that becoming somebody's experience here in the name of Jesus. We look at some examples in scriptures. We have, first of all, the example of Nehemiah. Nehemiah was a man who had passion for the kingdom of God, passion for the city of God. And the Bible tells us in the book of Nehemiah chapter 1 from verse 1 to 11, how that this man Nehemiah had come to hear that the Jerusalem was in distress, the walls broken down, the gates burned with fire. And he went before the Lord and began to fast and pray for many days. And we know how in chapter 2, verse 1 to 8, how he went before the king and almost put his life in his own hand, saying, how will I not be in this condition? Why will I not be sad? When the city of my fathers, when the place of my father's sepulcher has been broken down and compromised and burnt with fire, and suddenly the Bible said that the hand of God, the good hand of God came upon Nehemiah. And we know his story changed at that point. The man who was the cupbearer of the king, in chapter 5 and verse 14, we are told that he became the governor of Jerusalem. A change of story by simply advancing the cause of God. There are too many people chasing many things on the earth today. And the things they are chasing seem to be running away from them. But there are some who are chasing God. And the things others are chasing seems to be running towards them. That's what happens when you and I make God and his kingdom a priority. Your faith begins to deliver supernaturally without struggle. I see that becoming somebody's experience here in the name of Jesus. Second example we have is Job. Job was a man in the book of Job chapter 1. We are told concerning him how that he was blessed on every side to the point that he became the greatest among those that were in the east. Job 1 verse 1 to 3. But we know that when Job got into his challenge, for him to experience a turnaround, what did God say? He said, pray for your friends. And Job prayed for his friends and the Bible says, God turned around his captivity. The moment God's mission was Job's priority, what Job was chasing after came running after him. If you look at what the Bible shows us, we find Job's turnaround in chapter 42. Between chapter 2 and chapter 41, there is plenty complaint from Job. Why will you not change my situation? Why will I remain like this? I've done so many things. Why is it that things are this way? And God said to him, listen, you need to chase my mission. Stop making yourself a priority. Make me a priority. Pray for your friends. And the Bible said when he prayed for his friends, what he has been arguing for from chapter 2, turned around in one verse. Chapter 42 verse 10, he said there, and the Lord turned around the captivity of Job just by engaging in obedience to what mattered to God. When what matters to God matters to you, then what matters to you will become a matter for God. You see, that's the cheapest way to make God take over. God took over the affairs of Job as Job presented what mattered to God before him. I see God taking over your battles in the name of Jesus Christ. Somebody believe me, say louder, amen. The third example we have is Paul the Apostle. Paul the Apostle we see from scriptures was a man sold down to God. In, Acts, in 1 Corinthians 9 verse 16 and verse 17, 
We find Paul the apostle speaking there. And he made very clear, he said, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. He said, Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. And verse 17, we are told there, he said, For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against in my will, a dispensation is of the gospel is committed unto me. If I do it willingly, there is necessity laid upon me, and woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. And if I do it willingly, my reward is sure. So you see clearly from scripture, this was a man sold out. He got to that point of saying, woe unto me if I don't preach the gospel. Woe means, let me be cursed. He put himself under a binding condition. And by reason of that, we see how Paul went from the back to the front. The one who was called the chief of sinners became the prince of the apostles. On the basis of his commitment. You see, God is a specialist in rewriting stories. He's a specialist in turning around captivities. He's a specialist in, in, in redescribing destinies. And that is what occurs when a man begins to put God at the forefront. Is somebody getting what God is saying? You see, it doesn't matter where you start with God. What matters is that you stay with God. And when you stay with God, God changes your story. The man who should have been relegated to the back, the man who should never have had any kind of name worthy of note, became the one who even the apostles that he met, that were apostles before him, made him a reference point. Paul Peter began to say at a point, he said, according to the wisdom that is granted to our brother Paul, he said, which certain things are written by him which are hard to be understood. The man who was not there when Christ was present began to reveal Christ more than those who were with him by reason of his commitment to the advancement of the kingdom of God. Please hear this and hear it very well. If nothing can stop your commitment to God, there is nothing that will stop God's manifestation on your behalf. And that's why you and I must ensure that at every point in time, don't hide your commitment push with your commitment. You must ensure that at every point in time, you are displaying your zeal for the Lord. And I see each one of us experiencing change of level as we do. Somebody believe it, say louder, amen. Now, number two characteristic of the faith that work, works is that it is fear-free faith. Say, be fear-free faith. Say louder, fear-free faith. Like you mean it, fear-free faith. One of the greatest enemies of faith is fear. Where fear is alive, faith is permitted to die. But where faith is alive, fear is not permitted to live. The two are opposing forces. You cannot accommodate them together. In the book of Matthew chapter 14 verse 26 to 28, we come across this account where the Bible says that their disciples saw Jesus walking on water. And they were troubled saying, it is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. And look at what the Bible says. Jesus spoke to them and said, be of good cheer, for it is I, be not afraid. And look at verse 28. And Peter answered and said unto him, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come to thee on the water. That was Peter's request. And Jesus said to him, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But what the Bible says, it said, when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. Go back to verse 29 and see what he said. He said there he came out, came down out of the ship. Ship is here, water is here. He came down out of the ship and began walking on water. He said, but when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. Now, question. Is it that when there is no wind, you can walk on water? No. Wind had nothing to do with his ability to walk on water. There is no one who would just stand and say, okay, there's no wind, no wind, so let's go and walk on water. You don't walk on water whether there is wind or not. So that you are walking on water, the wind has no consequence. But the Bible says that when he saw the wind, he became afraid. One of the things that, that baffled me is this. How many of you know that nobody can see wind? Do you know that? You can't see wind because wind is movement of air. All you see is water moving around. But the water you are moving around, that's moving around, Jesus has stabilized it for you by his word. You see, many times what you fear is not really real. It is like wind. You can't see it. But Satan amplifies it before you. 
And this man beginning to sing, cried out, Jesus, save me. And Jesus asked him a question. Why were you afraid? Why did you fear? The wind had no effect. It had no consequence. There was nothing the wind could do to you. But Satan focuses you on the wrong thing in order to amplify your fear. Please hear it and hear it very well. Fear is always a product of wrong focus. It is always a product of wrong focus. The truth is anything you fear is simply the depiction of a wrong focus. Of the ability of that thing to hurt you. Wrong focus. That's what happened to Peter. Fear came and sinking began on the basis of his observation of the wrong thing. The psalmist put it this way in the book of Psalm chapter 42 verse 5 and verse 11. He said, why art thou cast down, O my soul? He said, why art thou disquieted within me? Hope down in, hope down in God, for I shall yet praise him, for he is the help of his, for the help of his countenance. Why are you disquieted within me? Many times when you see yourself, your heart beating, you are shaking, having cold sweat, sometimes you need to ask yourself a question, why am I afraid? What am I concerned for? What is shaking inside me like this? Why is my heart unstable like this? You will discover that it's a wind, something that cannot be seen, but the devil is making you to feel. You see, you must come to recognize that for your faith to deliver, it must be void of fear. For your faith to deliver, it must be void of fear. Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 25. The Bible puts it to us this way. It says, Proverbs 29 verse 25. The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. The fear of man bringeth what? A snare. But whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. The moment your trust is invested in God, safety is sure. There is nothing to fear. Shout hallelujah. I remember a number of years ago, God's servant began to speak very prophetically. And he said, there is nothing in the devil to warrant your fear. There is nothing in the devil to warrant your faith. You know, there are many people that glorify the devil. I tell people all the time, faith glorifies God, fear glorifies the devil. The moment you are afraid, it's like giving devil Satan praise and worship. You are just celebrating his ability. But when you, are, when you are in faith, you are glorifying God. And that's why it becomes important for none of us to give room to the devil. Don't give him room. Don't give him room. He gets you, he tries to, you know, scare you by bringing images your way. Refuse to give him room. Shout hallelujah. Because I've shared how that number of years ago, he was asleep. And while asleep, the devil showed him an image of himself inside the coffin. And he said, inside that dream, he responded directly to the devil. He said, Satan, you must be stupid. He said, because there is no wisdom or counsel or knowledge in the grave. If it is some other people, that is where all nights begin. It is from there that they begin going from place to place. I need deliverance. I need, you need to pray for me and deliver me. I saw myself. How, when did a dead man see himself? They go around advertising what Satan is saying. And please hear this and hear it very well. What I've discovered is this. Satan shows you something for you to say it because you will have what you say. He shows you things for you to say it. And you go around advertising it. See what happened. See what happened. See what I saw. See what I saw. And before you know it, you begin to see those things that you saw coming to pass. I've heard people say, I don't know why many times I see all manner of bad things in the night and they normally come to pass. Is it a spirit of prophecy? No. It is a spirit of satanic demonstration that is showing you for you to make repetition. And when you repeat it, that's where prophecy begins. Because according to scripture, you will have whatsoever you say. Is somebody getting it now? So when Satan shows you a picture, respond to him adequately. Satan, you are foolish. You don't have the capacity. I am a child of God. And whatsoever is born of God will overcome the world. Shout hallelujah. hallelujah. When you begin to operate from that frequency, you will paralyze the hold of fear. 
My prayer for each one of us is that from this day onward, fear will never have a hold upon you. Somebody believe it, say louder, amen. I said fear will never have a hold upon you. You believe it, say louder, amen. So your faith must be fear free for it to deliver. Must be what? Fear free for it to deliver. Number three, your faith must be expectation steered. Expectation steered. Expectation steered. Expectation steered. The Bible makes us to understand in the book of Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. For your faith to deliver, it requires hope. And what is hope? Hope is expectation. You must have a tangible expectation to see your faith deliver. And that's why the Bible makes it very clear to us in Psalm 62 and verse 5. It says, Psalm 62 verse 5, My soul wait thou only upon God. Why? Because thine expectation is from him. So our expectation is a vital necessity to see our faith deliver. Don't forget in the book of Proverbs, we are told in verse chapter 23 of Proverbs verse 18, it says, surely there is an end. And what will happen? Thine expectation shall not be cut off. So the question is, what are you expecting? What are you expecting? What are you expecting? It's amazing to me how many people pray without expectation. They are asking God. I'm not saying, what are you saying? I'm saying, what are you expecting? Many people pray without expectation. They are asking God for specific things, but they are not expecting those things to happen. You see, expectation is not a blank desire. No. Expectation is anticipation of something to come. When a woman is pregnant, they say what? She's expecting. What she's expecting cannot be seen, but is anticipated to come. She begins to behave differently because there is something she's expecting to come. Is somebody getting it now? It has not yet arrived, but it is being incubated inside. That is how faith also operates. It starts where the seed of expectation is found. Where something is being incubated that you are anticipating to be delivered. That's what it takes. So faith has to do with expectation. I've seen many people say, Pastor, I don't even know. I just prayed and something happened. And the prayer you prayed in the morning, that God answered in the afternoon, and you are shocked that it was answered. It showed you were not expecting anything. Is somebody getting it? Prayer is not trial by error. Prayer is guaranteed to be answered when it is approached with expectation. Shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Is somebody getting it now? It is guaranteed to be answered when it is approached with expectation. When it is approached with expectation. Many times you find individuals today who will paralyze their faith because there is no expectation. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I desire this, but they have already made plan B available just in case plan A doesn't work. Why? Because expectation has been circumvented. But when expectation is truly alive inside of you, you are anticipating something that is to come and it begins to affect everything around you, including your conduct, because you can see that something is being incubated that is yet to arrive. Shout hallelujah. I say shout hallelujah. I say shout hallelujah. This is what God is showing us. So our faith must be expectation steered. Number four is our faith must be patience boosted. Patience boosted. One of the vital forces that provokes the delivery of our faith is patience. Hebrews 6 verse 12 tells us, it says, be followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 35 and verse 36. It says, cast not away your confidence, which has within a great recompense of reward. It says, but you have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you may obtain or receive the promise. So, patience is a vital requirement. If your faith is going to deliver, you must engage the force of patience. Now, let me caution us because we must recognize that patience is not waiting and watching. But patience is waiting and walking. 
waiting and walking. Not just waiting and watching. Because there are many who will sit down and say, I'm just waiting on God to act. I'm waiting on God to step in. No, it is waiting and walking. What are you walking? You are walking the word and waiting on God. That's, that's what it's all about. Walking the word and waiting on God. Look at the second testimony we had. 24 years, that family was in shambles. But then this woman says she heard God's word concerning advancement of God's kingdom. Put aside the prayer point she has been praying. Now I want you to count. 1995 to 2015. How many years is that? How many years is that? 20 years. Praying for her family to be restored for 20 years. No turn around. And suddenly she began to engage. And as she began to engage in advancing the kingdom, 20 year prayer point was perfected within 4 years. Hello? She said 24 years. The family was separated. 20 out of the 24. Praying for the family. No turn around. Lord, deliver this family. No turn around. Lord, change this family. No turn around. Lord, touch the heart of this man. No turn around. And then, four years. Lord, advance your kingdom. Lord, let souls be saved. And not only was there a turn around, but she was already in the restored home within that time. By reason of engagement in obedience to the advancement of the kingdom of God. You see, you must understand that it is a patience game where you war with what God has said. You engage with what God has said and you see him establish his word. Shout hallelujah. I said shout hallelujah. It's very important that we recognize this. The Bible says concerning Abraham, he said he hoped against hope that he will become the father of many nations. He said according to that which was written, so shall thy seed be. He said, therefore, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but he was strong in faith, giving glory to God, being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was also able to deliver. Hallelujah. All of this on the basis of patience. Say, no way. I will stand with God. I will war with God. I will engage with God until I see what God has said come to pass. Now, please hear this and hear it very well. The time of obedience is never long. It is all about engaging in obedience. I checked through the scripture, I discovered something. Abraham was said to wait for 25 years before Isaac was born. But if you check it very closely, from the time Abraham was 75 until the time Abraham was 99, Abraham was wavering. The Bible said even at a point he had Ishmael. By reason of looking for different calculative ways to bring God's promise to come to pass. The Bible says that that was the seed of the flesh. The flesh was dominating. But then suddenly in chapter 17, God spoke to Abraham and said, Abraham, walk before me and be perfect. Stop all this, we will rule all this, all this uh, mago mago you are doing. Stop it. He said, because as for me, my covenant is with you. The problem is not with me, it is with you. He said, and Abraham at that time stood firm with God. Between chapter 17 and the time Isaac was born in chapter 21 was one year. One year of consistency with God broke the back of 24 years of wavering. You see, if you recognize that the pathway to the fulfillment of the promise is your spiritual stability, you will stop wavering. God's servant has said many times, many of us start over and over again. Because we begin engaging, we begin obeying God, we begin believing God, and then suddenly we draw back, and then you start again. You draw back, and then you start again. At a point, Abraham said, no way, I will stand. I refuse to shake. God has said that he will give me the seed of promise. I refuse to shake. And suddenly at that time, the child came. So when God talks about patience, he's not talking about, about delay. There are people who say, okay, if God is the same person, does it mean that I'll have delay? No. Patience does not mean delay. That's why I said it's not waiting and watching. It is waiting and walking. Waiting and walking. Waiting and walking. Engaging with God to see the fulfillment of his word. Shout hallelujah. I said shout hallelujah. So our faith, if it will walk, must be patience boosted faith. May each one of us today receive grace for spiritual stability in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. James chapter 1 verse 6 down to verse 8 the bible said let him ask in faith but nothing wavering because he that wavers is like the wave of the sea he said let not that man think he can receive anything from the lord a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways 
if you are going to make much out of your walk with God, you must recognize that you require spiritual stability. Starting and stopping will not get the job done. It is consistency that brings about supernatural delivery. My prayer is that for each one of us, whatever has been wavering in us will be destroyed tonight. And from this encounter onward, you will keep stable in your walk with God. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lift your hand to heaven and give God thanks for his word that you have received tonight. Give him thanks and give him praise for his word that you have received tonight. Lord, thank you for your word that has come my way tonight. I give you the glory. I bless your holy name. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. Somebody believe, say loud, amen. amen. Before we go any further tonight, if you are here and you are not yet born again, the faith that works is the faith that is rooted in redemption. He said, whatsoever is born of God is the one that overcomes the world. Until you are born again, you cannot win again. A life of triumph starts with salvation. If you are here tonight, you say, Pastor, I want to give my life to Jesus. Or maybe you are wondering in your heart, I'm not too sure if I'm saved or not. If you are not sure, then you are not. Salvation is something that gives you what we call the assurance. Assurance of it. Wherever you are tonight, you want to have that assurance of salvation. You want to become a child of God with conviction. I want you to quickly rise on your feet. I want to pray with you. Both here in Canaan land and in any one of our zones. Quickly rise on your feet right now. I want to pray with you. You say, Pastor, I want to surrender to Jesus. I want to have a new beginning with him. Quickly rise on your feet right now. I want to pray with you. God bless you wherever you are quickly on your feet. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Also, there are those who are here who need to rededicate their lives to Jesus. Something has gone wrong somewhere. Inside you, you know it. Nobody will know it, but inside you are, you are aware that you are not connected to Christ. Something has gone off course. You feel this sense of spiritual isolation, spiritual disconnection, and you want to return to Jesus so that you can be restored. Wherever you are tonight, you want to rededicate your life to Jesus. Quickly rise on your feet also. I want to pray with you. All over this place, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. All over this place. You want to rededicate your life to Jesus. You say, Jesus, I want to start afresh. I need a new beginning. I need to start afresh. I need a new beginning. Quickly on your feet, wherever you are. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Now, those who have responded to the first and the second call, I want you to make your way quickly to the altar now as we get set to pray. Give Jesus a big hand, everybody, as they begin coming. In all locations, make your way towards the altar. We are getting set to pray. If that hand clap is for Jesus, you will make it louder and bigger. It's not too late to join the others coming. Hasten your steps as you come. God bless you. Make your way quickly. Make your way quickly. Jesus is calling upon you. Never too late. Never too late. Never too late. It's knocking on the door of your heart. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If you are still coming, you can rush forward and join us. Thank you, Lord. Now, lift up your right hand unto the Lord and pray this prayer after me and do so in faith. Say after me, Lord Jesus, I come to you tonight. I am a sinner. I cannot help myself. But I know you died for me. On the third day, you rose again just to save me. Jesus, come into my life as my Lord and Savior. Take control of me from this day forward. I will follow you, no turning back. I will serve you, no turning back. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Keep your hand lifted. Father, thank you for these precious ones that have come tonight. Your hand has drawn them and I ask that, that your mighty hand will uphold them. That none of them will draw back from following after you in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for it. In Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Congratulations. It's a new day. Please follow after the kingdom, friends. They will direct you in completing your forms 
before you return to your seat. Shall we rise on our feet, everybody? And from the depth of your heart now, I want you to speak to God. Lord, I receive grace. You are praying with every one of those points.